Hello, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Charles Spaulding with the Scleroderma Research Foundation. This is our 15th live webinar, and I'd like to remind everyone that our entire series, as well as other patient and research-related news, are available to you at no cost on our website at sclerodermaresearch.org. Our webinar series is made possible by grants from Gilead Sciences and United Therapeutics. Today's session will feature 40 minutes on scleroderma diagnosis and early management of symptoms. We'll then wrap up with about 15 minutes of Q&A time. Uh, just a reminder, the phone lines have all been muted, so if you have a question, please use the chat box in the conference window. Uh, please do remember that our webinars are for educational purposes only, and no information provided is to be considered personal medical advice. Please also keep in mind that the SRF depends on your support. You can help us to fund the research that will find better treatments and a cure by making a donation today after our time together. It's now my pleasure to introduce our special guest. Dr. Bowen received his MD degree from the University of Padova Medical School in Italy. He completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical and experimental rheumatology at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Bowen is a translational research specialist. His research applies laboratory results and technologies to clinical settings where patients receive their care. In 2006, he joined the faculty of one of the world's largest scleroderma specialty clinics, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Scleroderma Center, a center that the Scleroderma Research Foundation helped to launch and continues to fund today. Dr. Bowen's research focuses on the cellular biology of immune cells and the mechanisms of autoimmunity and scleroderma. His goal is to identify reliable laboratory tools that can help investigate the causes of scleroderma, effectively measure disease activity, monitor treatments, and help predict clinical outcomes in patients. It's now my pleasure to introduce him today as he presents diagnosis and early management of scleroderma. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Francesco Bowen. Thank you again to the Scleroderma Research Foundation and uh, in particular, Deanne Wright, Luke Evening, Amy, and uh, everybody else working for the foundation. Uh, this is a kind invitation and thank you to all the participants who signed in to be here today with us. Um, the, it's always a pleasure for me to, to intervene in patients related forums. Uh, I find it rewarding and I think interacting with the patients is, is a crucial activity. Um, Patients are not just a uh, simple bystander in their care. Uh, they are actually at the center of, of the medical act, also in terms of help, helping the doctors to, to do a better job uh, in understanding more deeply the nature of their disease, to learn how the disease is affecting them, and uh, also learning what side effects the medication that we prescribe are causing suffering. For this reason, in the patient that my patient knows in my practice I always give a lot of time, all the time needed to make sure that the patient have a clear understanding of their condition, of what's going on, what do should they, they should expect from, from their illness. Um, and this is the purpose, I think, of, of the talk today. We will discuss in general terms the diagnosis of scleroderma, possibly the early diagnosis of scleroderma, and also go through some of the most uh, important manifestations, particularly we will dis discuss how we approach the management and the treatment of, of, of this complication. Uh, I think there will be time uh, at the end for, for questions, so we will also have some live uh, interaction. Um, just uh, uh, we will, these are <laughs> some patients. Um, so scleroderma uh, literally uh, means hard skin. And um, this, I want to clarify that this is a general term and there are two main categories. One is the systemic sclerosis and the other is the localized scleroderma. Localized, also called morphia, affect the skin only, whereas the systemic sclerosis, which can be divided into limited and diffuse, can affect uh, internal organs. So it's a much more uh, involved uh, condition. The... The, scler the scleroderma belongs to the systemic autoimmune disease family. 
and uh, same family as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome. It's a rare uh, disease. It occurs in 20 person per million every year, so this is the incidence, and is present a, around 300 patients per million people. Uh, it, um, the, there is a predilection for the female gender with a ratio of four to one. Um, the age of onset on average is between 40 and 50 years, but uh, can affect any uh, age. We have uh, pediatric patients and also patients who develop the disease later on in their life. Affect all races, and it's a chronic uh, disease. The first uh, important key point today is that scleroderma is a chronic disease, and uh, as such, uh, has a long history, even before the patient developed the symptoms. Um, you can see that at some point of your history, there is a trigger that can initiate the disease process. But for a long time, no symptoms are affecting the patients. We, this is the preclinical phase. It can last months or years. Until then, there is some new manifestation and patient becomes aware that something is wrong. It's very important that we understand that there is underlying damage even before the symptoms are present. And this is crucial because it means that early diagnosis is very important to stop the ongoing damage. You don't start to have uh, complication or, or uh, organ damage from the disease when you have the symptoms. You start before. So by the time you develop some symptoms, it's already time to intervene. And um, the, the challenge of an early diagnosis is posed by the fact that early on, scleroderma has nonspecific symptoms. It can present with vague complaints that are common to patient going to the general doctor. And for example, you know, some cold sensitivity, swollen fingers, some numbness and tingling on their digits, joint pain, increased acid reflux, weight loss, some shortness of breath. These are not specific. And unless the physician has suspicion and put them into the right context, there is di delayed diagnosis. And delayed diagnosis means also delay in a prompt effective therapy. Um, that's why I think early diagnosis is a crucial step in uh, providing better care to patients affected by scleroderma, to break the cycle of damage before it's too advanced and becomes uh, irreversible. Uh, scleroderma is usually classified into two main subsets based on the degree of uh, skin involvement. Uh, diffuse scleroderma intuitively affects all the body, in, in particular the trunk, whereas the limited form of scleroderma affects the skin on the distal portion of the extremities, distal to the elbows and the knees. There are two subsets, but again, the bottom line is the central part of the body is spared. Um, there is also another group of patients that many experts would uh, call in a different way. They don't have distinct skin fibrosis, skin involvement, but they are already on their way of manifesting uh, features of scleroderma. Some experts call them early scleroderma. Some others call them scleroderma sinus scleroderma. You may, you may have heard these terms. Some other experts still define them as undifferentiated connective tissue disorder, meaning that they have not acquire a definitive kind of set of manifestation. But precisely for the slides I showed you before, it's very important to diagnose the disease early before it's too advanced. It is for this reason that we always look seriously also to early manifestation. And for example, Raynaud's, the cold sensitivity, is by far the most common symptoms that patients report years or months or years before other type of scleroderma related uh, manifestations. And it's interesting, there are some studies looking at patients that just presented with Raynaud's. Uh, the first study uh, is a big cohort of 639 patients, the second 288. 
And they follow patients over time to see how many of them would have actually developed clear diagnosis of scleroderma. As you can see in the first group, 12% of patients over five years turn into a definitive scleroderma uh, condition. In the second group, 11%. And so the researcher said, what was the best predictor that characterized the patients who actually, from just Reynolds, turn into a full scleroderma patient? And they found that there were abnormalities on their nail fold capillaries, and we will talk about this. And also, these patients have some specific autoantibody, a scleroderma-specific autoantibody. These were the best predictor that characterized these patients that progress towards scleroderma. It is for this reason that the expert working in scleroderma felt the need to extend the way we diagnose scleroderma, and Dr. Mesker and Dr. Leroy were prominent experts in the field, proposed uh, early criteria which now are accepted as, by most scleroderma centers as diagnostic for uh, scleroderma. And they proposed that a patient presenting with definite Reynolds phenomenon with presence of abnormal nail fold capillaries, and we will show you what that means, and the presence of scleroderma-specific autoantibodies would be recognized as having scleroderma. Uh, Reynolds, it's something probably most of you are familiar. It's, a, it, it's an episodic vasospasm, uh, episodic lack of blood flow to the extremities that happens in response to cold or emotional distress and present with the typical color changes affecting the fingers and the toes like uh, white or blue discoloration. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. The capillary abnormalities that I was referring to are detected at the nail fold capillary level where um, we, the capillaries normally are perpendicular to the skin, but on the nail fold, they become flat, so you can follow their contour. And as you can see in this picture, you don't need much science here to realize that something is wrong. You see that there are these kind of big, large capillaries. Some of them are even ruptured here. This is an area of hemorrhage. Or you have this kind of avascular area. You lose the capillary. And this is just some patient where you can see it on, on your own. At the, at the office, we have simple tools like a, an, opt, um, an ophthalmoscope, with, and these allow us to see these are normal capillaries on the lower right. These are normally loops, and you can see how different they are from the extreme right here where you see these giant loops or, or, or these kind of drop-offs. So again, this is very helpful. Scleroderma, it's a vascular disease at the very bottom, and therefore detecting early that blood vessels are damaged, it's a very important predictor to say we are facing a progression towards scleroderma. And of course, there are some other uh, skin uh, changes that can be occur early. Um, in particular, uh, there are these famous red dots, uh, they are called telangiectasias. They are vessel abnormalities uh, that, that do not affect the capillaries. They affect the post-capillary venules, but still they can be present on the skin uh, or even in the mucous membranes on the tongue or inside the, the oral cavity. And sometimes these are early manifestations that precede other type of uh, organ involvement. Regarding the autoantibodies, uh, and that's the third component here of uh, the early criteria, it's important to uh, state clearly that autoantibodies are a test. They are not a diagnosis per se. So it's very important to put them into clinical context. However, they are extremely helpful because scleroderma has specific antibodies, antibodies that are pre present in scleroderma patient only and not in other type of autoimmune condition. Not only they are specific, but also each of them identify a possible type of manifestation that will affect patients that are positive for these autoantibodies. So very quickly, just going through them, if you have anti-centromere antibodies, more likely you're a woman, Caucasian, and 
people with these autoantibodies tend to have more vascular disease, less fibrosis, less scarring. Uh, they have, in fact, most of the time they have a limited scleroderma phenotype, and they tend to have more vascular disease with Raynaud's, with ulcers, with pulmonary hypertension. Um, they are protected from other type of lung disease like the scarring in the lungs. Patients who instead are positive for the anti-topoisomerase one or SCL70, that's the other name, are more affected by skin fibrosis. They tend to have a diffuse form of the skin. Uh, on the long run, they develop more flexion contracture over their joint. And also, there is a clear, strong association between the positivity of this autoantibody and, and development of interstitial lung disease. Again, interstitial lung disease means pulmonary fibrosis. Patients who are instead positive for another important autoantibody, the anti-RNA polymerase 3, more than other patients tend to have rapid involvement of their skin, tend to be more rapid and more severe, uh, but they are protected in terms of their lung involvement, their lung fibrosis. Um, there is an association between this autoantibody and renal failure, the scleroderma renal crisis, and I didn't put it on these slides, but we have been recently identifying that there is an association with cancer. So patients who are positive for anti-RNA polymerase 3 always need to be closely screened for any underlying cancer. And then finally, another fre frequent kind of positive autoantibody that we find in our patient is the, sorry, I go back, is the anti-RNP, anti more common in African Americans. And uh, the important thing to know about anti-RNP is that it presents with overlap features with other autoimmune diseases. Oftentimes, patients can have uh, manifestations that are typical of lupus, for example, or like of rheumatoid arthritis. So it's always important to um, be attentive to diagnose all the different type of manifestations. So I think this is already important no understanding that from a preclinical status there is an early disease and we are more and more appreciating this early disease to be able to intervene promptly. Early disease does not mean necessarily that everybody that has Raynaud's and the capillary abnormalities and the autoantibodies will progress towards an aggressive form of scleroderma. Actually, it is true that in a lot of, of these patients, more than half of these patients will have no progression and will remain for a long time stable without other organ manifestation. However, we do follow patients and we do see that the disease can become progressive. Uh, skin involvement being the most uh, evident physical finding. And uh, while skin can have a different degree of, of severity, ranging from virtual no match skin uh, fibrosis towards some uh, to the other extreme on the right side, a patient has a lot of skin disease. What's crucial to uh, um, understand is that a physician must always look for early organ-based complications, which can be present in any skin subset. So the patients that we see are always a combination of this clinical manifestation, you know, vascular, gastrointestinal, lung, the kidney, the heart, the muscle, the joints, and so forth. So scleroderma is a complex disease that can affect any organ. And the, the task, the duty of the physician is to define with precision what is affecting the patient that is in front of he or she at that time. So today I will touch on the main manifestation of scleroderma, particularly the heart and the lungs. We, we're going to talk also about some Raynaud's. I will leave out the gastrointestinal and the renal complication as they have been exhaustively discussed in the past two webinars that the Scleroderma Research Foundation have hosted. And uh, so you can definitely go back to those excellent talks and seminars gave by Dr. Denton and Dr. Parishka. So let's talk about a little more about Raynaud's. Uh, the Raynaud's is um, prevalent in the general population. So it does not mean that if you have Raynaud necessarily you have scleroderma. It's present around 3% of the population across the globe. Um, pre it prefers women rather than men and younger rather than older individuals. The major question is always, is Raynaud's present on its own as a, as a primary Raynaud's, as we call it, or is that secondary of 
to other condition is a red flag for something else that is going on. Just keep in mind, for example, that in young teenager women, it can be much more frequent. Usually, though, that's what you see in, in, in patients that uh, have just primary renal, you know, a symmetrical uh, involvement of the extremities. But we need to look at other aspects associated with the Raynaud's that can be predictive of progression towards, sorry, I'm just trying to, progression towards a definitive uh, connective tissue disorder. One second. Okay, so when do we suspect scleroderma or a connective tissue disorder? First of all, late age of onset. That's always concerning if somebody in their 50s or 60s all of a sudden de develop brain nodes. Second, males. Males, it's unusual that they have a, a primary brain node. Asymmetric distrib distribution, as you can see in this uh, picture here, is very different from the previous one. Here there are some fingers are affected, some other not. The fact that the brain nodes become more severe and that is not just the color changes, but people develop ulceration, that's always a red flag. The presence of autoantibodies, as some of them we discussed them before, and the nail full capillary abnormalities. Once again, if those are present, we know that it's different from just primary Raynaud's. What are the consequences of Raynaud's that we need to keep into consideration when we are dealing with this problem in our patients? Well, at the beginning, Raynaud's is just a vasospasm, which is reversible. The blood vessels shut down, as you can see here. Uh, but eventually, if this kind of vasospasm becomes prolonged, there are complications such as clotting, micro-clotting. So there are some clot that can form because the blood doesn't flow, and that therefore brings an occlusion to the blood vessel. Or over time, this fact that the blood vessel open and close and get into hypoxia can cause progressive vessel injury. The vessel will thicken up and the, the lumen becomes narrower and narrower, and now the damage is reversible. The lack of blood flow becomes permanent, not episodic like uh, before. The two main consequences that we always deal with patients in, uh, in scleroderma are ulcers, but there are two, sorry, there are two types of ulcers that, that affect the fingers of our patients. And I want to spend one minute just to clarify because this is a common question and, and, and a very important issue to, to be aware of. There are ischemic ulcers, so ulcers that affect the fingertips, and those are due to the lack of blood flow. These are a sign of worse Raynaud or, or poorly controlled Raynaud's. Uh, they are more common in patients with limited disease and uh, also can be worsened and can be triggered by certain type of medication or smoking, for example. And they are different from other type of ulcers, the ones that tend to develop on the knuckles of the patients. These are more traumatic, are due to the fact that there are flexion contracture over these joints and that the fat pad is thinning. And any trauma can prompt the formation of an ulcer. So these are different, have a different kind of uh, origin. Irrespective, they can get infected and they are very hard to heal. So you need to take always good care of these ulcers when they form. Here are some examples. This is an ischemic ulcer. Once again, they are deeper. They, they tend to be very painful uh, and um, always are associated with worse renal symptoms as opposed to these other ulcers that instead are mostly due to traumas. What kind of strategies do we have? Again, I won't treat exhaustively Raynaud's. I just want to give you some ideas, some hints on how to, to manage uh, this problem. So the first and most important strategy is lifestyle modification. Uh, I call them the avoids. Of course, intuitively you avoid cold temperature. Uh, you can wear gloves and mitten, but don't forget proper clothing is not just the periphery. Also, the central core temperature needs to be protected. Otherwise, your brain will send input to trigger Raynaud's. Emotional distress is the second important factor that we discuss can trigger Raynaud's. Smoking, active or passive smoking, that can somehow, quote unquote, choke the blood vessel and cause vasospasm. Traumas 
or even some drug that can increase the narrowing of the blood vessel, like Sudafed, the migraine medications. So those can worsen and make more active renal. So you need to be aware to try to avoid these possible triggers. But in terms of intervening, what, else, what other medication do we have? Well, we aim, and remember these slides I just showed you before, we have three main goals. One is to reverse the vasospasm. The second is to try to prevent occlusion of the blood vessel, and the third, to slow down progression of vessel injury. Uh, the vasodilators, I, there are many. I just want to emphasize that there are some first-line agents, the medication that we think are more effective and usually are the starting therapy for patients developing renal. These are the calcium channel blockers and the phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Probably you are familiar with this name, the calcium channel blocker like nifedipine, amlodipine, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, the family of the sildenafil or the Viagra family. Those are very effective. We use them alone or even in combination if symptoms progress and become more severe. I also put the prostaglandins. In the old days in the United States, we were using them only for acute problem, but we learned from our European colleagues that oftentimes they can be given over time, uh, cyclically during the year. And we indeed find that they have a prolonged benefit after they are infused. These are infusive therapy. Prostaglandins are given by infusion and have long-lasting effects. So for more severe cases, these are another important drug that we have available. We are still waiting to have the oral formulation that will hit the market hopefully soon. Then there are second line agents that are helpful but not that effective. None of these will help on their own to control Raynaud's phenomenon. The most famous one is the nitropaste, the nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin paste. Just remember it's very short acting, so you have to put it multiple times during the day can be absorbed and can have side effects. Half of the people develop headaches, and so it's not always very uh, kind of uh, manageable. And then there are these other medications that have shown some benefit, but in our experience are not strong medication and will not be used alone, will not be effective alone. Finally, I mentioned Botox. This is a, you know, something that has come out in the past for acute event, and now they're proposing, there are some trials actually to verify whether by giving periodic Botox to the finger, at the base of the finger, may be helping improving the symptoms. Uh, the key thing is to every patient responding in a different way to medication, so titrating the dose and finding the right combination is the most important uh, strategy for uh, effective treatment of Raynaud's. Uh, I won't stop much on these slides, just to say that we want to protect the blood vessel on the wrong run, and so we believe that antioxidants, such as statins or N-acetylcysteine, may be good medication to prevent progression of the narrowing that is irreversible. The problem is that it, it takes a long time to prove that they are of benefit, and so there is no company willing of investing in clinical trials to show that they are helpful. So we, we use them when we can or when they are indicated also for other reasons, uh, but uh, we don't have a definitive proof in none of these other medications that over the next five years they will prevent progression of the disease. For the occlusion, I always like to add some aspirin to my patients that have active disease, again, with the goal to prevent small clotting. And there are other medications, like the one on the lower part of this uh, slide, that also can have help preventing platelets from forming the clot. Unfortunately, despite all what we do, there are some patients who develop what we call the critical digital ischemia. You can see this is an angiogram, and here where the arrow is, there is a complete blockage of an artery. If you compare to the finger nearby, here there is a nice full patent artery, and here is completely blocked. This is a medical emergency. That, that's when we get in trouble with our patients. One thing is to have just a little ulcer. One thing is to develop gangrene and tissue infarction. Unfortunately, this happened. How do you know that you're moving on that direction? Persistent digital pain, a pain that is prolonged, increasing, unremitting. That's a medical emergency. I always instruct my patient, you need to call me right away because we don't have time to wait. By the time you see the black part appearing, it's probably too late, and the risk to losing the finger or that fingertip is very high. 
So this is one of the cases where you are justified as a patient to call your doctor on uh, their cell phone. What do we do when we have these emergencies, these crises? Well, first of all, the immediate action is to maximize vasodilative therapy. That's the first option. Maximize the medication that you're already taking. Second, if you haven't taken any antiplatelet therapy like aspirin, we will add it. And third, we can use intravenous prostaglandins, infusion of prostaglandins, to try to maximize opening up the blood vessels. Uh, some offices do local injection, so you can do a simple digital block or even Botox injected here at the base of the fingers, as you can see on the right uh, cartoon. And those also can help, help chemically to release the contraction of the blood vessels and try to reinstitute blood flow. There are surgical options. One is sympathectomy, and the other is even bypass vascular surgery if a blockage is actually identified. Um, it's unclear whether using blood thinner or even like uh, fibrinolytic therapy, the therapy they use for stroke or heart attacks, are of any benefit. It's unclear whether there is a, a, a long-term uh, um, kind of improvement by using these in the acute uh, setting. So we are not routinely using them. I want to say one word on sympathectomy, which is still practiced uh, everywhere, but it is a helpful intervention if you are in a, an acute situation and nothing else is working. Basically what they do, uh, as you can see here, they make a little incision and cut the nerves that actually go to the blood vessels. But be aware that this does not cure the problem. Over time, for some reason, the nerves are able to rewind their system and the Raynaud's start again. So it's not a permanent cure to Raynaud's. And the other thing is that, remember, the scleroderma is a scarring disease. So when you do this surgical intervention, a lot of patients then develop contracture here on the fingers and they curl their fingers in a remarkable way. So just be aware of this. It's, it's a helpful intervention, but it's not... Uh, you know, a permanent definitive te therapy. Skin-wise, let's talk about the skin. I want to point that once you present a limited scleroderma phenotype and that's established, you will not evolve into diffuse. So once you had a limited disease for years, it's unlikely you're going to wake up in the morning and develop diffuse skin disease. The disease have different phases when affect the skin. The early phase is inflammatory. There is edema. There is kind of redness on the skin, a lot of pain and tightness, and also itching. These are typical of the early phase. And then you slowly progress into a less inflammatory phase where uh, there is more dryness. The skin becomes more dry and tight. And then on the late phase of, of skin involvement in scleroderma, there is just chronic damage with atrophy and a lot of contractures. That's how normally the different stages progress and these are some pictures I wanted to show. This is a patient with early, and you can see the faint redness and the almost edema present in the skin of, of, of this forearm and this hand. And then here, another example of early phase when you start, the patient here lose all the hair, uh, and there is this kind of redness, flame skin. And over time, this is a picture from late fibrotic phase, the inflammation goes away and the tightness the, the flexion contracture are, are left. Then depending on the texture of the skin, for example, there are the discoloration are not, are not uncommon with like what we call salt, salt and pepper uh, changes or like vitiligo light. And there are also other features that affect, affect patients on the long run. How do we uh, assess? How do we assess the disease? Well, uh, what we do for living in our offices is pinching people because we use what we call the modified Rodman skin score. This is just a, an assessment of the severity of the disease, so to define how thick the skin is and also how, many, how extensive it is. So we pinch the skin of the body in different areas and we come up with a, with a scoring system. But it's very important to understand that it's not just the number of the skin score that matters. We also want to use our clinical computer. We want to ask how is the quality of the skin? Are there new areas? What are the symptoms that the patient is reporting? You know, itching and pain. Uh, is there worsening of the flexibility? It's very important to be sensitive also to these qualitative changes because those tells you whether the disease is active or not, even before you have a change over time of the skin score. 
And this brings me to the next slide, which I think is the key, the most important one for the skin that I want to share with you. Uh, the active skin involvement uh, start, so in, on the lower axis here, on the X axis is the time, is years. And then on the Y axis is the skin score. So you start at time zero here. And as the disease progress, your skin gets more and more affected. As you can see, the skin score goes up. Until in a variable time between 10 and 18 months, it tends to plateau and stabilize. And then in the vast majority of patients, 80% of patients, the skin tends to heal itself. There is a, for those of you who had the disease for a long time, know that there is softening, that that happens. Only on a small percentage, it tends to persist as a chronic uh, problem. Why is this important? Well, it's important because if you come to my office and you are in this phase up here, so you already develop all the possible involvement that your skin can take, and you are in this plateau phase, I will not start treatment. Why? Because very likely you're going to undergo softening on your own. You're not going to need toxic medication to make the skin better. Conversely, if you are instead in this phase, you know, in, the, in this kind of growth phase where the disease is still spreading, is active, then we want to intervene to achieve the therapeutic goal of aborting the progression of the, of the, of the damage. So you are trying to achieve this dotted line by intervening early so your skin is not as damaged and as extensively involved as if nothing is done. So depending on when the, your diagnosis, when the diagnosis is made, then there is option for intervention. But it's also important to not to use medication when you don't need them or when they are not helpful because they're going to just bring toxicity and no benefit. The treatment options, therefore, are one, to watch and supportive care or to use a traditional approach with low-dose immunosuppression. And third, always, particularly if you go on a specialized center, there are novel therapies or clinical trials available to try to achieve even better control or aggressive form of immunosuppression. And I try to summarize uh, this uh, possible intervention uh, on these slides here. So traditionally, we use non-selective immunosuppression. The two drugs that are most commonly used are mycophenolate or CELCEPT and cyclophosphamide. Uh, old days, they were using methotrexate and isothioprine. Still, some uh, experts use them. They are less potent than the, these other medications. Uh, and then can, in particularly can be helpful if there are uh, associated uh, complications such as jo joint or muscle uh, disease. Um, if more control is needed, you can certainly start them as a single therapy. Uh, you can switch them. Cyclophosphamide might tend to be m more potent than, than Celsept, but also more toxic. And you can use combination. Uh, there are some uh, reports. They're not large report or, or very strong, but certainly they suggest that using IVIG in combination with previous therapy is more effective. And actually, we have experience in our own center at Johns Hopkins. We are using that to the point that there is a formal trial that has been starting to see whether IVIG, even alone, can be effective in controlling the fibrotic manifestation of the skin. And then there is the cell-based immunotherapy, the autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant. You heard about this on the media. There has been a lot of uh, kind of discussion about uh, this type of intervention. It's very aggressive. It is effective, but always comes with a price. It, it is a very is a toxic and there is increased uh, mortality associated with this type of therapy. And then there are some other possibility. I talk about clinical trials or attempt to use directly antifibrotic focused targeted therapy. We are not yet uh, at, at the finish line with this type of therapy, but they are always uh, a possibility. So our approach for skin is to start with active but mild skin disease, to rule out lung disease, and start with CELCEP or with a novel therapy. If the disease is more rapid and severe, with or without lung disease, to use combination therapy with IVIG, or to switch to more potent drugs such as cyclophosphamide. As we said before, skin uh, is, is visible, is easy to detect, but also, uh, and has a significant impact in the quality of life, uh, but is less relevant for, for long-term outcomes and for survival of our patient. The money always is in the internal organs, and particularly in the lung and the heart. 
that are more relevant for the prognosis of scleroderma uh, patients. So let's quickly switch to the lungs. So when we talk, so ILD, I'm going to use this abbreviation, ILD, to indicate interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, scarring in the lung. On the left side of this slide, you see this is a CT scan of a chest. On the upper part, this is a normal CT scan with a nice dark lung tissue. And then there is some changes until on the lower part, you have all this white thickening. This is like scarring. This is fibrosis. This is a damaged lung. How frequent is this? Well, it depends on what you use for definition, you know, but if you take a CAT scan on every single scleroderma patient, it's likely that up to 80, 90% will have some component of scarring in their lungs. So that's why the prevalence is 25 to 90%, depending on how you define or how you detect the scarring. It's more frequent in patients with diffuse scleroderma, as we discussed before, 40-50% of those with diffuse skin also have interstitial lung disease. And is an imp probably the most important cause of morbidity and mortality at this time. One important message, having ILD or interstitial lung disease does not mean that invariably you're going to be doomed to have very aggressive severe disease. Only a subset estimated between 15-20% progress towards severe end-stage lung disease. And this is represented in this uh, slide here. This is the cohort at Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Messer and Dr. Steen published this, this data on their cohort just to show, and I don't want to get into the detail, but that if you look at the, their lung function, the FVC stands for force vital capacity. It's a, it's a result that we, you, you have when you do the pulmonary function test. So if you look with those with only minimal change, over time, they do really re relatively well. So this is the lowest recorded force vital capacity during their history. So there is a group of patients, and this is survival, right? So where the survival is pretty benign. There is an intermediate group and a small percentage, 15 20%, where instead the disease is much more progressive and severe. So the point here is that we need to do a better job of understanding who are on this path. So what with patients are taking this course versus a more benign kind of stable course? And these are the ones that benefit from more aggressive intervention. So who is at risk for lung disease? Well, as I said, diffuse disease is more commonly affected by limited disease. Uh, the presence of certain autoantibodies, topoisomerase 1 and RMP are the important one. People with anti-centromere, anti-polymerase 3 tend to be protected. Early disease. So the, the vast majority of onset of lung disease is within the first two to four years from disease onset. So during the early phase, it's always important to look for lung disease. Certain, certain racial uh, ethnic backgrounds, so African Americans tend to have earlier disease and tend to be more aggressive and severe. Abnormal pulmonary function tested diagnosis, and I emphasize this, you need to do your pulmonary function test right away at the baseline to see where you are. Abnormal tests early on predict more progressive disease. Same for the CAT scan. When we find abnormal pulmonary function tests, we tend to obtain immediately a CAT scan of the chest to see if there is fibrosis. And depending on how much fibrosis we find, we can predict whether the disease will be more or less aggressive. What kind of symptoms patients develop? Well, they can be silent. So you, for a long time, you may have progressive lung disease without any major symptoms. So, so be aware of that. The fact that you have no symptoms does not mean that, that's, that, that lung involvement should not be assessed. Shortness of breath, and again, shortness of breath can have a lot of different reasons for, for being present that is not related necessarily to scarring uh, in the lungs. So for example, presence of anemia, that's, that's, that's a possibility. Deconditioning, muscle weakness, COPD. But nevertheless, when this is unfolding, it's important to take immediate action. C cough is another symptom. It tends to be a late symptom. It can be due to acid reflux. It can be due to post-nasal drip. Certainly, there are other explanations. But again, the onset of a chronic cough always should raise concern about underlying uh, pulmonary disease. And fatigue. Sometimes you work harder to breathe, and, and the only symptoms you manifest is getting more tired than we are used to. Irrespective, you need to be aware of these symptoms and report them to your doctor promptly. What kind of tools do we have? Well, 
we talk about the risk factors, but we do have the pulmonary function test, the CT scan of the chest, the walk test. Well, some, some offices use the six-minute walk test, but I, I put into quote-unquote walk test, meaning that your walking test is the most important one, meaning that even before the instrument, the test will detect something wrong with the lungs, you will know if you have a good baseline physical activity routine. I always encourage my patient to uh, entertain regular aerobic physical activity, power walking, something that push you a little bit so you know if something is changing because your ability to endure a walk is decreasing. You were able to do 30 minutes with no problem. Now after 15 minutes, you feel short of breath. That's a walk test. That's a change. You know something is changing. So it's very important, the physical activity, the regular conditioning for every patient. There are, I don't go into bronchoscopy and lung biopsy because they are no more used and, and, and they are not routine, um, routinely used ma uh, instruments to detect or to um, diagnose interstitial lung disease. Pulmonary function testing, as we discussed, are the key most important study that we do to screen for lung disease. Um, it's a good measure to follow also the disease over time. Uh, we do uh, pulmonary function testing in every patient at least once a year. And more than 10% 10 10 change drop in the lung function is predictive of progressive disease. That's why it's important to do them every year and even sooner if there are some symptoms that raise concern. The CAT scan, as we said, is, an, is a good uh, test to define how extensive the disease is. And uh, it predicts outcome and also further decline based on the extension of the lung involvement. So we use them in combination, pulmonary function test and CAT scan to really screen the patients and define, um, to stratify the risk and define who may need intervention sooner rather than later. In terms of the overall strategy, I want you to remember this slide. You know, the, the function, the overall functional status, which is here on the, on the, on the y-axis, is, it remains okay even if the lung function is going down until you hit 50% of your lung function. When you hit 50%, your overall functional status will invariably decline. So the, the key point in terms of the strategy to, to follow lung disease is, number one, early detection, followed by monitoring, and then number three, aggressive therapy when the lung volumes become lower. Because at this time, we have, it's not like the skin that, that we, I showed before the graph. The skin somehow has the ability to heal itself. The lung do not. Once you lose lung function, that's gone. So it's very important to be very aggressive and prompt in initiating therapy. What kind of option do we have? Well, we have uh, non-selective immunosuppression against CELCEPT and cyclophosphamide. There was the SLS study that, that used uh, the show that cyclophosphamide was uh, effective even if the benefit was uh, moderate. And now there is a, a SLS, scleroderma lung study too, that will compare mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide to, show, to try to define which one is better. Uh, same discussion for the autologous stem cell transplant. Once again, it's a very aggressive therapy and you pay a price for it. It's very effective on the skin. It's still unclear whether on the lung is effective. There is increased morbidity and mortality and we do not have long-term data to tell us whether on the long run, ultimately, it will be better than conventional therapy. And don't forget lung transplant. That's a valuable option not all the centers in the United States do accept scleroderma patients, but both on the East and West Coast, there are dedicated centers that are um, taking care of our patients. And um, I skip slides. I want to show you two uh, important messages. One is perfenidone. It's a new drug that is, um, has antifibrotic and anti-inflammatory properties. This is a very recent trial uh, that has been conducted in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is different but has some similarities with the scar tissue in the lung that scleroderma patient develop. And this is an encouraging trial because patients who are taking perfenidone, you see this curve, this is the lung function curve. The lung function declined a little bit, but not as bad as those who are taking placebo. So there is an ongoing trial for scleroderma patients using this drug. And our hope is that this will be the first drug that really can reverse the scarring or can stop the progression in a very effective way. And the next slide is, is a report out of University of California, San Francisco, regarding lung transplant in scleroderma patients, uh, showing that there is no overall 
uh, long-term uh, difference between scleroderma patient and another type of lung disease patient. Because the, the argument always is that scleroderma patient we do uh, more poorly, um, and that's why a lot of centers don't want to do the lung transplant. But here are the two curves. The dotted line is other disease, the, the solid line is scleroderma. They have the same long-term outcome. And to conclude, the final part very quickly will be on well, the pulmonary hypertension, the vascular part of lung uh, disease. Um, as you can see, the, uh, heart, there is a, a connection between the heart and uh, the lung. They are connected, and actually, the, the circulation goes from the right heart through the lung to the left, to the left heart. For reasons that we are still investigating, patients with scleroderma tend to develop narrowing and uh, loss of blood vessels at the pulmonary circulation. And basically, the consequence of this problem here is that the blood pressures, instead of being low, they immediately go up on the right heart. And this is a problematic problem because the right heart is very thin and not very strong, with their, therefore the tendency to develop sooner rather than later um, heart failure. The presence of pulmonary hypertension has to be taken seriously because the outcome is worse in patients affected with uh, pulmonary hypertension compared to other patients. As you can see, this is a survivor curve where compared to other type of lung involvement without pulmonary hypertension, uh, the presence of pulmonary hypertension suggests a worse, uh, entail a worse uh, outcome. Who uh, is at risk for pulmonary arterial hypertension? Well, late, on, late age onset of scleroderma, limited scleroderma, more severe vascular manifestations such as Raynaud's, more intense Raynaud's, or the appearance of large telangiectasias always needs to raise concern and suspicion for uh, progressing pulmonary vascular disease. And uh, also some of the autoantibodies. Symptom-wise are similar to the symptoms we discussed for the interstitial lung disease. It can be silent, but patients may progressively become more short of breath. Always watch for presence of lower extremities edema, uh, sw swelling on the legs, because that's an early sign of right heart failure. Um, what kind of test do we have to uh, assess for pulmonary hypertension? The main one is the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart. This is a very good screening tool, uh, easily performed and non-invasive. The limitation is that it is operator dependent, so it's not always precise. But it's good to raise suspicion if there are abnormalities of pulmonary hypertension. The second test is the right heart catheterization. This is more invasive but this is key to confirm the presence of pulmonary hypertension. So everybody should have a right heart, heart catheterization if the suspicion for pulmonary arterial hypertension is raised. It's very informative. It's give, it gives us precise measurement of the pressures in the right heart. And this is crucial to be able to start proper therapy. Uh, we are using more some blood tests that can be helpful, the ProBMP. You probably heard about this test. Uh, the levels are directly related to how severe the pulmonary hypertension is, so how high the pressures are on the heart. Uh, and also, change over time have been predictive of survival. So it's a good biomarker to look at to see how well we are controlling the pressure on, in the right heart. Um, the management, therefore, this is just to summarize the management, is that we need to do routine clinical assessment with regular echocardiogram. Once again, this is done once a year, no matter what, uh, no matter how healthy the, the patient looks, you need to do it once a year. If there is no suspicion for pulmonary hypertension, we just routinely follow. If there is an abnormal echocardiogram, unexplained dyspnea, or declined lung function that is not explained by interstitial lung disease, then we proceed with the right heart catheterization, and if the pulmonary hypertension is confirmed, we uh, initiate immediately uh, therapy. Again, prompt initiation is crucial for success. What kind of medication we have available in the United States? These are all FDA approved, so they are all option viable to treat uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. They are of different classes. I don't go into the details of them, but just want to emphasize that all of them address a specific mechanism involving the pathogenesis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, they, all of them can be used as single agents or in combination, so there are options uh, the important thing is to define how severe the disease is and to establish the proper uh, therapy. Uh, 
lung transplant also is a valuable option for end-stage uh, disease that is no more amenable to respond to therapy. But the crucial take-home message for the available treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension, once again, is early diagnosis. It's crucial for success. You need to monitor regularly to, be, to rule out onset and progression of this, of this problem. So to summarize, uh, I put in these slides the main principle to manage scleroderma. Number one, define the clinical phenotype, meaning the type of manifestation that the patient has. Every patient is unique. You cannot go by the book and say, oh, he has scleroderma, therefore this is what we need to do. No, you need to learn what's unique in every patient. Second, carefully look for specific organ involvement. Remember that the disease is deeper than the skin, always. So always look for any hint that the internal organs are involved. Third, define the clinical stage of the disease. The disease course is, is complex. I, I, I hope I gave you that idea that it's very complex. And so it's always important to define where the patient is in terms of their manifestation. And finally, customize and redesign therapy. Therapy has to be tailored to the specific needs of that patient. You need to do focused therapy to make an impact. Um, with this, I conclude. I hope I gave you and you, know, you understand why I put all the faces is because uh, every patient is really uh, unique and affect the patients in a specific way. Um, the, um, you, you need as a physician to listen, to examine, to learn from the patients, to know how the disease is affecting them, and to start therapy before it, before it is uh, too late. I finish with this sentence from uh, Voltaire, who said that the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Uh, I think that organization like the Scleroderma Resource Foundation or specialized center like Hopkins Scleroderma Center and many other throughout the world and the United States exist precisely to prove that Voltaire was wrong. You know, God certainly is the ultimate physician, but we always want to help him to get you better, to achieve control of the disease, and hopefully sooner rather than later to find a definitive cure. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. I'm D.M. Wright, President and a member of the Board of Directors of the Scleroderma Research Foundation, and I'm going to lead a brief um, Q&A session here. I apologize for uh, running over time on this talk. Uh, we have a bit of an audio problem in the beginning, but um, it was a great talk, Dr. Bowen. It was a great presentation for new patients and even for those who've been diagnosed for some time. This is excellent information to help patients and caregivers better understand and manage their derma. So um, we will use a few minutes here to answer some of the questions that have come in. If you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat box to the left of the main slide window. Um, Very good. Maybe we can get started. Yes. So. I can, I can uh, go through some of them. Probably won't be able to answer to all of them. Um, so the first question I want to answer is somebody asking to know whether uh, there is any proof that scleroderma is hereditary, whether you acquire it with your genes. I want to make sure that this is clear because it's a common question that I have from my patients. Uh, it's a, it's a multifactorial disease. Genes are important, but they are not the only cause of the disease. There is not a specific gene that causes scleroderma, and therefore you don't transfer the, predisp the um, predisposition of scleroderma necessarily to your children. Uh, it, autoimmunity runs in family, but there are other factors, the environment, infection, presence of other triggers, as we discussed before, can cause the disease. So it is not a hereditary disease. Um, other question, um, I can go through the list. Somebody asked if nail fold capillaries are specific to hand toes of both. Uh, probably there, there are damage of capillaries everywhere. Just the fingers, the fingernail, the nail bed is easier to assess and to, and to evaluate. But very likely, this is a systemic disease, so any blood vessel can be affected. Dr. Bowen, I have a question for you. Yep. Um, 
So you did a great job laying out the symptoms of the of lung disease and the tests that can be used on them. Yep. Can you sort of summarize or, or just clarify the recommendations that you have for routine monitoring? Yes. So uh, as we discussed, the disease can be silent. So because it is a main target in scleroderma, we routinely monitor for this disease even if the patient is asymptomatic. Uh, the, the best test that we have is the pulmonary function test as a screening test. The pulmonary function test measure how much air you're able to breathe in and out. And it can quantify this amount of air and follow that over time. Because lung disease uh, manifests with scarring, scarring decreases the lung volumes, and so we can track whether your lungs are shrinking, and therefore the, the, the volumes of the lungs are decreasing. So that's why we do it every year, or even more frequently if the patient is developing symptoms. And if there is a significant change, usually more than 10% from the previous testing, that's worrisome that there is progressive lung disease. We always do a CAT scan in that situation. The CAT scan gives us an idea of how extensive the disease is and also whether there are other causes that may be causing you know, uh, decreased, blood blood, blood, uh, sorry, decreased respiratory function, shortness of breath, or cough. Um, I think these are the best tests, and, uh, but the, the, the assessment over time is very important. It cannot be just a one-time testing. And, how, and so you do that at least once a year? You do blood, a pulmonary function test once a year, absolutely, or more frequently if there is any suspicion of, for lung disease. Okay, and, and, and what about routine use of echocardiogram? For, the, for the, 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 the other component, echocardiogram, as we discussed, heart and lungs go together, and, and so echocardiogram also is recommended once a year uh, in, uh, in our patients. To, to look for any abnormalities. Uh, one our area I didn't touch today is that also the left heart can be affected by scleroderma. So scarring can happen in the heart muscle too. And the echocardiogram is good to also def, um, detect early if there is any abnormalities of the left heart function. So no doubt that also the echocardiogram once a year need to be done in every patient diagnosed with scleroderma. We had a question about the um, variability and reliability um, in, the com in commercial testing for autoantibodies. Yes. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts to offer on that. No, no, I, I, this is a very important question because we do have referral to our clinic all the time with patients that the only abnormal uh, issue is a positive autoantibody, but clinically there is no um, evidence of scleroderma. We do want to see these patients, it's still important for all I told you before to uh, verify whether there is any red flag, any concerning finding. However, we, we have been seeing that commercially available testing sometimes provide false positive. That's why I emphasize that a, a positive autoantibody is a test. It's not per se diagnosis. You always have to put, put it in clinical context to be able to make sense of it, to use it appropriately. But you have to be aware that there are um, laboratories that can you know, have different type of settings, and therefore the test may come positive, and then when you retest it in a different facility, they are negative. We had another question about general recommendations for diet. I know there are are specific recommendations for yes. um, diet for people with GI disease, but are there more general recommendations for diet, such as any inflammatory diet? Or yes, so a healthy diet is important. Remember that we didn't talk about the gastrointestinal system involvement today, and so to optimize the diet is, is crucial. Uh, reducing uh, unnecessary fat, Reducing excess of calories is very important. Using uh, nutrients that have, uh, are rich in antioxidant probably is of benefit uh, in terms of decreasing the amount of scarring and also decreasing the progressive da damage uh, of the vascular uh, bed, of the vascular uh, structures. Um, however, 
I want to make sure that when the disease is extremely active and progressive, uh, just optimizing the diet or this cleansing diet, this chelation therapy does not work. I, wanna, I, I know I'm bold here, but I've seen patients that delayed proper treatment because they, they were told that by doing a gluten-free or a special cleansing kind of treatment or diet, they would be able to control this, the manifestation of scleroderma. In our experience, and we see a lot of patients, once the disease starts be, to become very active and progressive, those are not effective. So I want to make sure that this is clear. Otherwise, we, we, it happens we see patients that have delays of months or even years before they finally get proper treatment. Dr. Bowen, we had a question about um, calcinosis. Yes. And whether uh, you can talk about how you address that as a, a clinical problem. Yes, calcinosis is, is, is it's a frequent problem, particularly in patients with very active Raynaud's and the limited form of scleroderma. Um, the, the, the nature, the origin, why some patients are more affected by this accumulation of calcium deposits, it's not very clear. We don't have a scientific explanation for that, uh, but it is, it is evident that poorly controlled um, uh, vascular disease it's, it's a predispos predisposing factor for more severe calcium deposit. Uh, the, there is no treatment that melts away the calcium. So that we don't have a medication or an, a treatment that we can do to really resolve the problem of calcinosis. When the calcium accumulates in, in, in difficult areas, so um, areas where it's causing a lot of pain, discomfort, or even ulcers and infection, Surgery may be an option to the bride to clean out, but here is the, here is the problem that, that trauma of any kind is a trigger, a known trigger for calcinosis. So even surgery itself can clean out the calcium, but then trigger further a new accumulation. So we do it very seldom when really there is no other option. There are some treatment we are investigating to see if we can improve the burden of calcium deposit. But the major intervention is to optimize control of Raynaud's and the vascular disease, and second, to avoid trauma in affected areas. That's the best we can do now. We should do better, but unfortunately, we don't have still the magic switch for calcinosis. We had another question asking whether scleroderma can cause cognitive issues. Uh, <clears throat> this is not clear. Um, we, uh, we, we, there is no specific studies that uh, had extensively investigated whether cognitive dysfunction may be a sign of progressing scleroderma. Uh, however, we do know from other conditions of the same family, such as lupus, that, that uncontrolled underlying inflammation cause more uh, rapid deterioration of mental and cognitive functions. So it, there is no doubt in my mind that even if we don't have um, you know, a, yet a, a formal evidence that scleroderma is a cause of cognitive dysfunction, we always need to look for that because the well-being of the patient is not just pain control, but it's also the ability to function. And so we're, we are always very attentive to, to identify any form of, of uh, stress, any form of dysfunction. And we do have psychologists who work with our patients to try to optimize w when symptoms of, of, uh, of cognitive impairment are uh, detected. There, I saw one, one question saying that if there is any research or evidence showing benefit with light treatment, with ultraviolet light treatment. Um, and the answer is that the light therapy has been shown benefit for the localized form of scleroderma, the morphia, when this is uh, not extensive. In scleroderma, with the systemic form, with diffuse skin involvement, the benefit has been minimal. We don't have evidence that that's an effective way to take care of skin disease. First of all, because the entire skin is affected. Second, because the disease, the disease process uh, tend to be uh, more aggressive. And the light therapy, uh, you need to undergo 
significant amount of exposure before you can reach a proper uh, level to control the immune system activation. So we do not routinely refer our patient for UV or light treatment once they are diagnosed with uh, uh, skin involvement in scleroderma. Um, one question, is there a connection between atrial fibrillation and scleroderma? Um, this is an important point that I just hinted before. Atrial fibrillation or, or arrhythmias, rhythm problem, can be an early uh, sign that uh, not just the blood vessel but also the, the heart itself has been damaged. So definitely there is a connection and definitely that's why we do the echocardiogram and also even more invasive procedure if needed should we suspect that the muscle of the heart, the myocardium, is affected. Uh, there are two situations that the heart can be under attack in scleroderma. One is that the inflammatory process, the immune cells actually uh, attack the muscle cells of the heart, so there is a myocarditis, inflammation of the muscle of the heart, uh, and that over time can cause damage and scarring. The second uh, situation is just a uh, small vessel disease. Again, scleroderma is a vascular disease, and the vessel that actually nurture the, the muscle of the heart can get obliterated and damaged, causing a situation similar to when you have a heart attack. So it's not infrequent that when you do a, an electrocardiogram, an EKG, people find uh, abnormal tracing suggestive of a heart attack, and that can be another uh, very threatening situation that need to be promptly addressed and looked for. Dr. Bowen, we had a question about the use of plasmapheresis in limiting scleroderma progression, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on that that you could offer. There is, uh, so I don't, we don't think plasmapheresis is useful. Uh, so what does plasmapheresis do? Plasmapheresis filter your blood and remove antibodies and other uh, products that may be present uh, in the blood. Uh, it is effective in conditions where antibodies or autoantibodies are felt to be causative of the disease. All the research that we have been conducted, con that we conducted and others have conducted in scleroderma did not show that scleroderma is a disease mediated by antibodies. Therefore, the, the usefulness of plasmapheresis is not very good. And definitely this is not something that we do, uh, we propose to our patient. Uh, it's more useful in other conditions, but not in scleroderma. So we're just about out of time here, and I apologize again for running over and for the audio delay in the beginning of the seminar. I'd like to thank Dr. Bowen of the Johns Hopkins Scleroderma Center and each of you who joined us today. We're all a part of the scleroderma community, and only by joining together can we make faster progress in the search for better treatments and a cure. When you close the webinar window, you can provide helpful information back to the Scleroderma Research Foundation by completing the short survey. Please remember that we depend on your support to continue our investment in the most promising research. Visit us online at sclerodermaresearch.org or call our offices at 1-800-441-CURE to support our program. One quick note, our corporate partner, Apricus Biosciences, is excited to announce an upcoming clinical trial for scleroderma patients with Raynaud's phenomenon. If you have a patient who's been diagnosed with Raynaud's secondary to scleroderma and you'd like more information on the trial, please email trials at apricusbio.com. That's A-P-R-I-C-U-S-B-I-O.com. Thank you again for sharing your time with us today, and remember that this and all other webinars are available for free download on our website. Goodbye for now. <laughs>